Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, it's a great pleasure to see many familiar faces in this room. Uh, my role here is to moderate this panel on angel investing, entrepreneurship, and the innovation economy. Uh, but to be honest with you, we have an all-star team of panelists, so my job will be essentially to hiding in the background and, and trying to let the conversation flow. Uh, I don't want to steal too much time uh, from our panelists either. Uh, I think we all realize when we look at kind of where innovation is coming from that uh, angel investors, entrepreneurs essentially often that have experience and are porting that back uh, into the ecosystem that they're active in, uh, helping nurture the next generation of entrepreneurs having a huge impact on our society. Uh, when we look at the list of unicorn companies, the one you know, with a, over a billion dollar valuation uh, that are still private, many of them, Often at the very beginning, uh, there's a relationship with an entrepreneur and an angel. Uh, and so our role today is to discover a bit more about that relationship and understand how do you identify talent? How do you nurture talent? How do you make sure that uh, entrepreneurs don't repeat common mistakes uh, from you know, uh, designing their cap table to raising capital uh, to essentially surrounding themselves with the right kind of people? Uh, so investors, um, of course, have, have their own incentives when they come on board, but the right type of investors can help an entrepreneur grow substantially. Uh, and so I think that's uh, what we're hoping to, to discuss more. And, and we, we really have the, the right set of people, uh, both on the entrepreneurship side and on the angel side. I really look forward to discovering more uh, about their stories. So I'll ask our, uh, our panelists to uh, give a very quick introduction Along the way, feel free to tweet, um, especially if you're tweeting at my account. I'll be tracking your questions, so we'll, 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 we'll try to get you know, the wisdom of the crowd as it evolves uh, so that we can have the, the panel that is the most relevant for you. We will also open formally for Q&A towards the end, so we'll, we'll do the traditional route too. Uh, but Jean, why, why don't you start? Give maybe a very quick introduction about yourself, and then uh, we'll hear from the others. Thank you. OK. Um, uh, well, I'm, it's great to be here, 30 years for me, so that's a long one. <laughs> and, um, and after being a serial entrepreneur uh, coming out of Sloan, um, I, I, I became involved with angel investing, and I've actually spent about the last 15 years of my life doing angel investing full time. I'm a member of uh, three different angel groups as a way to sort of concentrate effort and, and, uh, and focus on that. And, um, and, I, and after about 12 years of what I usually call drunkard's walk angel investing, hoping to bump into a really great team. And of course, I put myself in all the right places to, um, to be able to bump into them, uh, being mentors at places like Techstars and um, being involved with other things that were going on around town. Um, I decided that I probably needed to do some focus. It was about time to focus. And so for the last three years, I've been focusing on ed tech companies as, uh, as, a, uh, as a primary place to put my energy. I also run an accelerator for ed tech companies and a co-working space and other things. And, um, and, and really my role out of Sloan, the, the main thing that Sloan did to me after having been an entrepreneur was I went to dinner one night with a classmate, and it's a pretty common story, and she said, you've had a successful exit. Aren't you supposed to invest in my company? And so that's how, <laughs> I, that's, how I, um, that's how I became an angel investor. I didn't even know what the word angel investor meant. Um, and, and also, that's how I became the first investor in Zipcar when Robin Chase beat me up. Dermesh? Hi, I'm uh, Darmesh. This is my 10-year reunion. Um, when I was at Sloan, I had just sold my prior startup, so I've been an entrepreneur. And uh, the idea for HubSpot, the company I ended up starting, uh, you know, came out of here and officially started the day I graduated because that was the only time I could actually officially work. Uh, before I started HubSpot, I had actually promised my wife the reason I'm going back to school is I'm not going to do startups anymore because I'd done that for 12 years. Uh, and I would promised her that was, that was it. Um, so the idea was like, OK, well, what I'll do is I'll start angel investing. This is while I was still a student uh, at Sloan. And I'll live uh, vicariously through the pain of other entrepreneurs. So I get to have all the kind of the fun, but then I can just go home. It's like having nieces and nephews, right? It's like that, they're real fun here. You can have them back now. Um, <laughs> so I started angel investing about 10 years ago. My first uh, couple of investments were uh, students that were in the new enterprises class here at Sloan, uh, where HubSpot also kind of wrote its original business plan. And then HubSpot started a uh, year after that. So I've, been, uh, I've made roughly 70 investments. Uh, HubSpot itself has been modestly successful. Companies 
public now, about 1,300 people uh, based still here in, uh, in Cambridge. But yeah, that's my story. Thank you. Karen? <clears throat> sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Karen Singh, uh, um, five year reunion, lots of 2011s in the audience. Uh, Where are the 2011s? There we go. All right. Yeah. <laughs> It's good, it's good to be back. Um, I was in Sloan in the uh, now defunct uh, VEP program, HST program. Started the company, our origin story was actually on campus as well. Met my co-founder, uh, Anmol, who was getting his PhD at the MIT Media Lab. I was uh, taking a class with Sandy Pentland. Uh, and in many ways, Anmol had invented what we like to say a new microscope, a new way to measure how people were doing based on data you could collect passively off of a smartphone. Uh, we spent the past uh, five, almost four or five years now, uh, selling to health systems, giving them a tool to be able to deliver better care. And over the last year, actually evolved into becoming a actual virtual hospital. So we support uh, people with uh, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, stress, and have our own clinical staff. Uh, we've gone through a couple rounds of financing, uh, raised about $28 million uh, and a $1.7 million seed round three and a half years ago, primarily from this community. Uh, and so we can talk about uh, some battle scars from that experience uh, and uh, represent the entrepreneurial perspective. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Tom. Um, very honored to be here. My name is Tom Rose. I'm also the class of 2011. And um, I remember when I was thinking about going to business school and I was asking people, should I go to business school or not, and blah, blah, blah. People were saying, oh, the value of the network. And I always remember thinking, like, well, that, that sounds like bullshit, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but then, when I went to business school, the, the most valuable thing that I got out of it was I met the greatest co-founder of all time, sitting right back there, Miro Kazakov. Thank you, Miro. <laughs> Couldn't do it without you, buddy. Um, and so Miro and I founded Testive um, while we were at Sloan. And so we're going on five years now with that company. And I I think what we do is we make educational software that creates superhuman tutors. It's a really, really fun job that I don't have time to tell you about right now. Um, but I just will say that uh, I, one more memory is when I was five years ago, when I was sitting here, I saw Darmesh on a panel. And then four ish years later, he sold his company for a billion dollars. So I figure I got to get myself on one of these panels. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, but I think the reason why I was asked to be on the panel is that um, I love angel investing and I love angel investors and Testive has more than a hundred angel investors and a lot of times people ask me how is that possible that sounds like crowdfunding um, which it sort of is but I have a kind of institutional approach to it and I love the community and so if you want to raise money from angels come talk to me I will hook you up <laughs> Thank There's you. a right and a wrong way. <clears throat> Good tell. Thank you. So I don't know if you noticed, but all our panelists have been way too modest about their experience and accomplishment and all of this. Um, Gene, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what does it mean to be an angel, right? So you told us how kind of the conversion happened, but um, well, so given your experience. Angel yeah. investing is really simple. It's uh, putting your own money to work in early stage businesses. So, you know, you can always, um, uh, be, if, you're, if you have the right... Um, uh, situation in your life, you could you could uh, get to be a part of a venture firm and let somebody else take your money and go find companies and follow a business model of looking for the most extreme high growth companies possible. Um, but if you're an angel, you're you're looking for companies that um, that can uh, return your capital well. And not every one of them will be the most extreme companies ever. Some of them will have a, a high growth profile and maybe be looking for an M&A event in four to five years that is um, lucrative for everybody involved, but doesn't necessarily have to fit this search for the unicorn perspective. Um, I always think of it as a contact sport best played in teams. And to me, I find that uh, being in angel groups, although sometimes they're painful and slow moving, uh, is a good way to be around other people who've done investing, a good way to be familiar with, um, with um, all of the different terms. And so really what you're doing is you're buying Series A, uh, you're, you're buying a preferred level stock, sometimes you're buying a promise of preferred level stock in the future, um, as, and, and, you're, um, and you're, you're usually, as a, as a result, the the group of you are, are doing something like taking a role in the board or other things. And most angel investors um, aren't doing individual uh, support of the companies. Um, they're, they're, they're doing 
maybe I'm supporting that company and my buddy is supporting that company. And so they're trying to sort of spread the wealth, but then maybe the email will come that says, can anybody bang the door open at the following three companies? And sure enough, somebody can help do that. So it's a, it's a, it's a use of human capital and actual capital used at the same time to support entrepreneurship. And, uh, and that tends to be the, the model. There's a, there's a website, angelcapitalassociation.org, and you can click on that and probably find angel groups all over the country near you. Um, and there's similar networks in Europe and Asia. So everybody feel free to jump in at any time, of course. I'm, I'm not controlling traffic. Uh, <clears throat> how does the learning happening? happen? So how does it take place? Uh, let's say one is interested in angel investing, is curious, uh, but there's a, there are also risk involved, right, when, when a, one hasn't built that experience yet. How should people go about thinking about that? I'll, I'll kick it off. It's, uh, so it's interesting. There's always a spectrum of competency in terms of uh, how much people know. Gene is at one of the spectrum, and I'm at the other uh, when it comes to angel <laughs> investing. So I think one of the things um, that's important to recognize is that um, there are a variety of, and a spectrum of different angel investors, right? Uh, you have some legal requirements in terms of um, you know, what you're allowed to risk, but let's say you clear that bar. Um, after that, you don't really have to know anything, right? You, all you have to do is be able to write a check. Um, there's no <laughs> certification. There's no, it's like, okay, if you have the uh, you know, luxury to kind of make that kind of risk, um, you can do it. And so I encourage people that uh, you know, have the funds um, to take some portion of their uh, net worth and put in angel investing because uh, it's very gratifying in order to kind of be able to participate. Uh, you learn a lot. A lot of what I've learned that I've kind of applied to HubSpot um, has been uh, through exposure through a bunch of different startups that I kind of see at, at varying stages. We've recruited um, through that. We've acquired companies I've invested in. So it's been uh, very beneficial. But I guess one message would be uh, don't let this uh, kind of mythical, I, I need to know X amount before I can write that first check. Uh, that's simply not true. Um, it, it, you can, entrepreneurs are happy to take your check. Um, <laughs> and they want the help, of course, too. But I've never had a complaint saying, you know what? I wish I hadn't taken Dharmesh money because he doesn't really uh, you know, participate all that much, which I don't. But anyway, that's, uh, yeah. So and what are kind of the obligations uh, after that? No, no, no obligations. I mean, you have to sign paperwork when it comes around that says, you know, we want to raise another round or whatever it is that, that needs to happen. And, and you are an equity holder by the time it's converted to equity, and usually it's pretty early, um, uh, in, in that company. And so you need to be... Um, you know, just that. Um, if you're on the board, obviously you're a board member. You have a whole lot of other responsibilities, but um, but um, but really, there's 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 nothing um, completely to it. Um, so uh, traditionally, angel investing has been uh, for high net worth individuals that pass a means test, um, uh, about a million dollars of net worth, excluding uh, your primary home. And, um, and now uh, the, the jobs bill uh, has a allowed a, uh, a set of uh, uh, ordinary folks to get into angel investing through platforms. Um, it's, a, it's a different class of offering and a little bit complex. And the first, uh, you were first allowed to do it on May 24th of this year. So nobody has a clue how it's gonna work out. Um, and, and it looks more like crowdfunding. Also, in angel investing, we've got a lot of crowd platforms, um, often, again, for these qualified investors like AngelList, or if you're into food and beverage, you could look at Circle Up. And so the food and beverage crowd are all over looking at food and beverage and other consumer products on a website called Circle Up. And so it's just a, there's a lot going on in the space in terms of trying to get um, funding out. And switching gears to the entrepreneurs, um, what should an entrepreneur, maybe a first-time entrepreneur, look like in the first angels they kind of partner with? Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've had the good and bad fortune, I think, of having some good relationships with angels and having some not so great relationships with angels. And there's definitely pattern matching to what creates a good re relationship and what doesn't. So, I mean, one of the things that's obvious, I think, is make sure that the financial goals in your long-term plan are in sync with what the investor wants. Different companies have different financial plans and different angels have different financial objectives with their investing. And what you don't want to do is, um, as, the, as the founder, what you don't want to ever do is misrepresent your plan because you run the risk that somebody might invest because they're confused about what you're doing. Like, you don't, you don't tailor the pitch to the person. You tailor the pitch to the company and if the person doesn't fit, then they don't fit. The same thing is true in reverse. Um, not a lot, you know, entrepreneurs, I feel like, really come to terms with this. But for angels, they come to the table. If you don't want to invest in a company that doesn't fit with your plan, 
So you want to make sure you know what your plan is um, so that you can do it. I guess all of this comes back to um, having, uh, you were talking about the spectrum of like informedness, which means if you want to know your plan, you want to do things wisely, you need to have some mechanism for becoming informed as an angel. Um, one of, I haven't heard it mentioned, but uh, one of the things that I think is really great for early, uh, early angels who want to become professionals or amateurs, and when I say amateurs, I mean somebody who has a different job but angel invests on the side. If, you, if you're one of those groups, a really great tool is groups. So you know, if you haven't heard of it, there's groups of angel investors that um, they run in, angels travel in packs, um, and the, they're called groups. Um, it's a flock of geese and a group of angels. And, <laughs> and uh, the, what the groups do is they provide. But they, in Europe, they're called networks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the groups not only, they so, the groups solve lots of problems for early angels. One of the problems that they solve is education. Like an early angel needs to be educated. Another problem that they solve for the angel is deal flow. So if you're thinking about becoming an angel, the Dharmesh was saying, if you've got a check, you can find somebody to write, to take your check. I'll take your check, <laughs> right? Like you could write a check and walk out of the room and you created a problem. Because what you want to do is look at 20 companies and invest in your favorite out of the 20. So if you want to make a good investment that you love and is a good fit, you need deal flow. The angel group will also provide you with deal flow. Um, you can't just hang out and watch, but if you're willing to put some skin in the game, you can get access to lots of deals. MIT, for example, there's, an, there's two MIT angel groups. Uh, there's MIT Angels Boston, there's MIT Angels Silicon Valley, right? So if you want to just get your feet wet, go to one of those two meetings. The other advantage to angel groups is they provide group therapy for angels. So if you're having those one of those <laughs> late nights, I'm not exactly sure what to do in this particular situation, they're very helpful. Yep. Karen, I believe you were going to add something. Yeah, no, yeah. certainly. I, I think that's, that's a great summary. I think so, we got some really good advice early on, I think, from some folks at Sloan. And it was um, sort, your, sort, your, sort your investors, your angels, specifically into A's, B's, and C's. The A's get it. As soon as you talk to them, they get the concept, they get the idea, and you're, you're kind of close to yes within a couple meetings at the max. Uh, the C's don't, and very quickly you know that they're not, they're not a, a good fit. And you waste all your time on the B's thinking you can convert them into A's thinking you can actually get them across the finish line. And I think so much of what, you know, when I think about where we didn't do so well in our, in our seed round, it was not focusing enough on finding our A's, finding those people who got it. And the, the get it is, you know, there's a couple of different dimensions to that. One of the most telling for us was the questions that they ask. And um, you know, we, we'll talk about this, and I think one of the things that we admire, or at least uh, Darmesh, I admire about kind of the way you've operated is you've been an operator and you understand what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I think um, while there is certainly this, you know, a, now a much larger pool of angel investors to choose from, um, I think you should choose wisely because especially as an angel, they're going to be with you for a very, very long time. Uh, they don't have to participate, but they can. And I think having honest conversations up front about what you want from them and what sort of support you're looking for, uh, and the same perspective that angels can be uh, group therapy for each other, they can certainly be a therapy for the entrepreneur and be really a, a support as you go through this emotional roller coaster, because it's going to be an emotional roller coaster. And so you know, I, I think there's a lot of dimensions that go into this. Um, I know that the, the Boston scene was really, really strong for us. We were part of the Techstars program. We were part of, uh, of Sloan and, and MIT broadly. Um, and that was tremendously powerful. And I think the last thing I would say is um, to figure out your A's, um, ask other entrepreneurs. Uh, and don't email them. Get in front of them. Hop on a call. They won't write, put it in writing. They'll never put it in writing. Talk to them. And they'll tell you very quickly who to trust and who not to. And you start to, there, there is a, a cohort of people that are all considered the A's. And they may not necessarily be the ones that you know of, but um, very quickly, if you can start to lean on your network, lean on other Sloan entrepreneurs, otherwise, um, I think you'll find people who, you, who can start to build that round for you. Because it only takes a few. Um, and it only takes one or two to get the, the ball rolling. So I'm going to ask, ask, ask you a question. Please. Tom was talking about alignment of, of goals with the angels. Yeah. And um, did, did you know early on you were going to take a lot of VC money? And did you communicate that to your angels? And, um, and, and did that sort out some of the folks that were going to be a good fit for you? Or, or, or how did that go? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so we had. Um, we had this kind of heuristic. So we would we'd have a conversation. And within the first five minutes, uh, there were two types of investors we found. There was the, the folks who started in the front of the deck and those that started in the back of the deck. 
and, and really, like we, we found that the people who went to the back of the deck, which was primarily the financials, the, like they wanted to see the revenue model, tended to not actually be a good fit for us at the seed stage. It clearly yeah. is at the, B, at the B when you're raising a massive round, but at the seed stage, it just wasn't the right set of questions to be asking. It was important to understand the revenue drivers and understand what are the hypotheses we're looking to test or the, the things we were looking to de-risk. And so, um, yeah, I do think that was a part of the initial discussion. Frankly, when we started, we were you know, an app, and now we're a hospital, virtual hospital. So like, the, the, the mental model is very different. The capital requirements are very different. You know, um, I, I wish we didn't have to necessarily raise more, more uh, financing. But um, um, I, think, I think the angels that have been with us through that journey um, are the, the ones that are, have been the ones that are able to adapt as we've been going through that. And I wish we knew the answer up front, but I think it evolved over time. So it sounds like it's very much like a matching market, right? So you're trying to find the perfect fit, and what's good for one startup may not be a good fit for another. Uh, how is the internet, in your opinion, changing any of this? Is it like increasing you know, search and discovery? Is it like reducing frictions? Um, is it improving the market or actually making it potentially more, more risky for you know, first-time angels and first-time entrepreneurs? I'm a little bit biased. I'm an investor in AngelList, which is one of the larger kind of networks for uh, angel investors and entrepreneurs to connect. But uh, putting that aside, it's, uh, I think it's been super helpful. So you know, I've done about 70 deals, and I'm solving for kind of time and, and not money. So I don't do due diligence. Usually most of my decisions are within 24 hours of initial contact, which is kind of um, a time I set for myself. And uh, so I'll give you a, a yes or no. And, um, and over, I'd say, between 60 and 70% of the entrepreneurs I've invested in, I've never met or talked to on the phone. And now some people might think that's crazy because aren't investors supposed to invest in people, which I would argue I do. I just have a different set of signals, right? So the signals now available on the internet, I can tell you within about two emails whether someone has arrogance or is egotistical or not, right? Like I know, that's, uh, um, it's, and it's easy to tell those kinds of things. So, but the, what the, um, the internet has, has been able to do is now um, you can kind of build this online network of people that you trust that you've been in deals with before. You have a structured way to kind of look at the profile. There's a accepted way for folks to put like a pitch video and things like that. So it makes the process more efficient. So overall, it's been, um, at least for me, immensely valuable. Most of our deals now will come through, um, through those channels versus uh, meeting someone in person. AngelList is uh, starting to move the needle. They're, they're probably of the probably about uh, 20 billion that's invested in angel investing annually. Um, angel list may be getting up into the 800 million kind of level, and so um, so it's starting to be a, a, a noticeable part, and and uh, hugely bi biased in terms of where the deals originate and where the money comes from to Silicon Valley, um, but but it's also a place where you can also do um, uh, follow the leader investing. So if you think that you know, somebody, um, Brad Feld is your idea of who to, right. to follow, then you can get on there, find things that he's um, doing, or uh, if he's running a syndicate, you can see if you um, can get involved in that. So it's, a, it's another method of doing that. I don't tend to do very much online at all. I do, of my about 170 deals, um, about all of them have been face-to-face -face deals. So there's, you know, I always say, oh, I've lost a little bit of money in very strange foreign countries like Canada and India <laughs> and California. All of them are dangerous places to re remote invest. And from the entrepreneur side, is are these platforms yeah. changing? Are well, you sure. updating your investors? Are I'm you at least uh, very grateful to Twitter um, because if you go back, you'll you one of the things you will find is that Darmesh invested in Testive by tweet, and he. <laughs> And he got bonus. He got bonus points because his investment came in the form of an SAT question. <laughs> Not joking. That was awesome. Um, but and so like that, I tell that story jokingly. But um, so having worked with a lot of angels, one of the things that I have observed is um, that transaction cost is an enormous cost for angel investing. It's an. I think transaction cost is probably a larger cost than bad deals for angels. Right, so if you could take your transaction costs down by half, that would be better for you than making twice as many good investments. Um, I'm saying these numbers off the cuff, but there's there's some balance in there that is true, and uh, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, there's certain, some truth. It's third, a third <laughs> to 80, something like that. Um, and in transaction costs, you're probably bundling the old, negotiating well, the contract. Of, there's there's trans so there's transaction. Uh, it's tempting to try to say like, okay, well, who does this transaction cost accrue to? Does it accrue to the entrepreneur? Does it accrue to the angel? Does it accrue here? Does it accrue? It doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, these are financial investments. It all comes out of the return. 
it doesn't matter where the cost is. Like if I spend extra time and that's a waste of time, that comes out of your return. If you spend extra time and it comes out of it, it comes out of the return. So for example, like one of the things that, so AngelList uh, is, a, is an online platform where you can put together syndicates of angels, you can look at deals, you can fund deals on AngelList. But one of the things that I've used, so we have not raised any money off of AngelList, but I have used AngelList a lot because on AngelList, for example, you can go see other deals that have been done by geography and you can look at deals by type and you can look at investors by the deals that they've done. So if you find an angel in your, on AngelList in your geography that has done three or four deals in a company that's in the same sector as you, you have to talk to that person. And so, uh, so I advise a lot of people who are you know, doing angel investing and one of the questions they always have, have for me is, how do I do top of funnel? It's like, okay, I wanna raise money from angels, like where do I get the first 10 people to have conversations with? And I always send them to AngelList. Um, just to like make that initial list. So that's it, like online fixed that. And you know, other examples of this are when uh, I probably raised maybe 50% of my transaction, like 50% of my angel transactions were done without ever meeting the angel in person. So I do a lot of face-to-face, -face, but we do it with Google Hangout um, and phone calls and things like that. Investing, if you, uh, as you can imagine, is a very trust-based thing. So just because you can talk on the phone doesn't mean you're ever gonna be able to get to that place where you trust somebody by phone. But now with Google Hangout where you can do face-to-face, -face, I've found that investors can quickly get to that place where they trust me, even though they haven't met me in person, but they've met me on Google Hangout. So that's lowering transaction costs for everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was a good summary. I, I, the only thing I'd add is, um, I don't think the physics have changed. Like I, I think it's you know to, to what Darmesh was describing. Like you have more signal, and so you can use that signal. You can access that data much faster, but it's still based on the same fundamentals of relationships. And you're still, I mean, you know, on the entrepreneur side, we often talk about it in the form of lemmings, right? You, you you're going to follow based on people that you trust and the people that have done deals that you you respect. Um, I think. Um, and, and so as an entrepreneur, it's, it's actually a, a wealth of information to start to figure out who to target and how to think about what, kind of what, where to go. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to say is on the transaction cost side, you know, I think the best on, uh, angels, in my mind, are, are the ones that don't necessarily try to get creative with the deal itself. It should oh, yeah. just be vanilla, no, no, no. plain, no, clean. No creativity. And, and it's the nice part is about... creativity in accounting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's and it's one of those things where if you you are using one of these tools, you know, it's pretty consistent. There's a there's a template, and and just from an entrepreneur's perspective, there's less less time, energy, investment required in kind of coming up with the deal terms and whatever else because for the most part, there are some standards now, and you can lean on that. And I, I think that's really really important. So it just it eliminates some of that friction, at least as uh, to to close. Great, why don't we open up to, to our group here? Uh, so if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, stand up and um, ask our panelists, please. Well, I have a question for the, the Angel Book Board. Do you mind standing up? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I have a question for the Angel Book Board. Uh, you guys come in at very early stages, and oftentimes companies at these early stages are still trying to figure out what they're gonna be doing, and they often also end up pivoting. And did you guys come across among your many investments into pivots that you disagreed with, and how did you handle those situations? I mean, especially when you're on the board, for example. Yeah, I mean, it happens all the time, right? That's yeah. just part of the entre entrepreneurial process. Um, generally speaking, uh, pivots that I've seen have been positive, right? So I'd rather them pivot when they think they need to pivot uh, than not, essentially. Usually, I, they err on the other side. They stick too long to something that's just not working instead of making the adjustments. Uh, but you know, part of uh, my approach, I think, and a lot of angels have this, is like the first do no harm kind of thing. So if, if the entrepreneur feels that's the right thing to do, if they ask for advice, I will give it. Um, but I try not to intercede in something that they feel is the right thing, whether it's a pivot or an acquisition or a funding round. Um, it's, it's the entrepreneur's call, especially at that early stage. It's, uh, yeah. So, so I think what we've got here is that both Darmesh and I invest very early. Um, we often invest in things that really are the team, the great idea, and just a little bit of market evidence that something's happening. Um, if you get out into the um, larger angel groups, you'll find that they'll be getting um, very close to true market signaling, that there's at least a pipeline of sales, there's the beginning of some market traction, the beginning of some sales happening. And so across that spectrum, your risk is changing like crazy, and also your likelihood of pivot is changing a whole lot. And so, um, so I guess uh, I always say that if you're, if you're willing to go as early as, as I do, 
Uh, and, and I even find myself sometimes coming before the accelerators. So, so you know, so, you know, hey, I'm in, I'm, I'm in this company that's in the Techstars crowd, but I invested in them before they even got accepted there. So, so I come so early sometimes that I just have to uh, put up with it and give advice. If they come in and say, hey, how would we weigh this versus this? I help them think it through, and I, I can only do what I can do, but by now having done so many investments, I have a lot of pattern match for things that might or might not have, have helped. When I'm on the board, it is a really different thing. You have to sit down and really dig in. And the board role changes a lot over the life of the company, too. First, you're down there in the dirt, digging around with everybody, figuring out what's happening. Later, you're sort of trying to set up the hey, do we actually understand what execution means? And eventually you're working on feet to the fire for the purpose of making them um, attractive to the next class of investor. And so across that, you're sort of changing your behavior, and they need to change their own behavior too. So uh, one of the things that's happening in an early stage startup is they're remaking themselves really, really fast. And if, you, if, you, if you're not aware of that, you have this tendency to think they're who they were six months ago, and they may have actually been three people between six months now and today. So it's actually often, you have to listen over and over again. Okay, we have one question over there. Hi, interesting. Last one about six. The beard guys. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, 95% of exits happen in M&A, and 95% of M&A is south of 100 million. And so if you can uh, raise four to $5 million out of angels and similar investors and exit in the 50, 60, 70 million range, why in the world? The entrepreneur will probably make twice as much as if they had taken a VC deal. And, and the angel will have a much higher IRR in a six or seven year exit of that type than they will in something where they waited for the 10 year overnight miracle to occur and, um, and, 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 got, and went through a lot of different funding rounds. So, um, so I guess my question is slightly different from that. If an entrepreneur is coming to you who doesn't want to exit quickly and or doesn't want to seek a multi-billion dollar exit, um, it, it, how many of those transactions have you guys done, and what is the source of follow-on capital past angels? And how do you counsel an entrepreneur? I'm fascinated by your comments earlier, and actually tested it. It seems like you were not seeking that massive, huge exit, so I'd be interested from the entrepreneur's perspective how you manage the angels and what were the follow-on Actually, I think he wasn't eligible for the massive follow-on <laughs> investment as an investor in Testiv. Both rounds. Yeah, right. Uh, so um, we're we're growth oriented. So I think there's a, there's a there's both a rate of growth, and then there's a final exit size. And so if you want to sustain a rate of growth for a long enough period to get to a billion dollar level, you're you're going to have to have boost phase capital, which is going to have to be large institutional investors. That's just the only physically way possible to do that. Um, Testive is high is growth oriented, so we need institutional. Or we need financing, outside finance. It can't be profit-driven growth or revenue-driven growth. Um, but we're probably going to, we'll, uh, we're targeting exits that are south of a billion dollars. So um, I'm not sure, am I, am I hitting your question? Or, yeah. or like, where does it come from? Well, but the angel groups now are often doing follow-on. So, um, so, so uh, uh, I think your, your, your launch pad led round was almost two million, right? Yeah. Right. So, so he had had a small amount of seed capital from angels, and then a two million launch pad angel group um, that that took him on further. And, and and I'm a member of a number of these angel groups. I help bring Golden Seeds to town, and Golden Seeds often does two million dollars into a specific company in a round. And so, 
Um, so again, um, so again, it depends a little bit on the size of the company. And again, back to that point I made earlier, as as you get to a large group and you're trying to move that much money, you're, you're starting. You have to be able to demonstrate market traction because many people in the group will find it uncomfortable to be around the um, around the lack of, of market evidence. Um, and so, so, so really, there's this sort of spectrum of, of risk um, tolerance, you know, that, that that varies a lot by by, by person. I have uh, something controversial to say to in, in like a response. Uh, it all depends on what the angel is actually solving for, right? So um, let's say you're after pure kind of venture-like returns, uh, like a, a, a VC-based return. Then the portfolio theory kicks in. You have to get the bigger hitters. You're not going to be able to uh, um, for you know, those kinds of returns. But the other thing, and this is uh, where I come from personally, where I, I don't normally do deals where I don't think the follow-on capital is going to be there, where it's not going to have at least a chance at um, some massive outcome. And the reason, and this is the confession, is I'm in it for the fame and glory as much as I am the return. Right? I want to know like, 10 years from now, it's like, oh, I was a small part of that particular funding team uh, because there's a lot of gratification. I'm, I'm uh, egotistical, as it turns out. But, uh, and, and that's... <laughs> And that works out well. That works out fine. But there's both models work. Um, but I tend to prefer, and partly because I don't do follow on, right? That's one of my kind of, kind of uh, limited set of cardinal rules. That's one of them. And so it's like, okay, well, they need to either be able to kind of get to break even um, so they don't become high maintenance or be able to go on and, and raise capital. But yeah. There are, groups, there are groups that lean different directions. So like, I'll, like Thai Angels, for example, um, like I remember pitching in that room. And the first question somebody asked me was like, uh, from your pitch, it wasn't clear when you're planning to hit cash flow break even. I was like, oh, uh, wasn't planning on doing that. Uh, <laughs> it's like, maybe we have a misalignment here. And then there's other groups, such as like Launchpad, which uh, is closer to more of a, well, they're such a big group that they kind of have all flavors. But there are other groups that tend to be more traditional VC where they're expecting uh, capital, capital, capital exit, you know? So if you, whatever you want, there's a flavor of that, I think is, is what I'm trying to say. And I think their, their mesh was raising an important point, which we haven't touched on, which is impact. So yes, you're in for the return, but a lot of this is also kind of seeding the next generation and, and seeing those startup uh, grow further. We had Jeff with a question. Yeah, so I'm an entrepreneur <coughs> with a bootstrap company. And uh, whenever we think about our uh, financing growth potentially, the conventional wisdom, as people always uh, will say, is don't do it. It takes up way too much time. Is that changing is that like what is your perspective the panel's perspective on the time that it really needs to take and is it you know is it still a distraction uh, for, for the, for the People ask me this question all the time. I advise a whole bunch of early stage entrepreneurs whose capital plans don't match their business plans. It's like one of the most common things that people bring to me. It's like, hey, I want to do VC, and I'm like targeting like this jewelry store. I'm like, all right, this is like, let's sit down for a minute. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, one of the things I basically always come back to them with is there's lots of ways to finance a company. None of them are free. If you want to do revenue financing, great. You're going to have to put a ton of effort into revenue, and you're going to grow slower. Uh, if you want to do VC financing, hey, that's great, but you've got to have a huge vision and you're going to have to spend a ton of time with VCs. You want to do angels, hey, that's great, um, but you're going to need to herd some cats. Like If you want to do debt, that's great, but you're going to have to hire an accountant and build up that plan so you can submit it. If you want to do an, a lot of people always come to say, oh, SBIR, free capital. It's like, well, you know, it's like, or you're going to spend, you know, 50% of your time like managing this grant process. There, there is no free financing. And I think that the important thing is, that, or what I tell the, you know, some of these entrepreneurs is, Make sure that the financing plan matches the business plan. And the business plan should drive the financing, not like your personal religion or something like that. We, we certainly have a lot of, uh, of, of other things that are um, now acting as signals to the financing crowd. So accelerators are an example of something that's um, signaling the financing crowd of, 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 of success. So uh, a third of all companies that got Series A's last year had been through an accelerator, maybe not that year, but sometime. And, um, and so we're starting to see a bunch of different um, things like that. Um, they don't usually hugely reduce the time. Um, but once you get a plan that's acceptable to a certain class of investor, you can move it pretty fast. Um, some groups will have a diligence process. And so if you just know that that process is there and you have the right employees to be able to handle it, it, it works pretty well. 
I mean, uh, an example might be Golden Seeds. So Golden Seeds requires that there's a woman in the senior management team to invest. And, um, and we've done tons and tons of training with our members to be able to bring women who have had great careers but aren't familiar with the high risk aspects. Nonetheless, we are always doing our homework and we write very, very large, deep diligence packages on every single company. Um, can move a lot of money, but it often takes longer. And, and, uh, and, and, and also, that there's been a lot of change in that. So when I first started investing, I was often the only woman in the room writing checks, maybe 60, 70 guys. Now, um, uh, in the angel groups, 25% of the members are women, and 25% of the angel investing are going to women-led firms. And it used to be 4%. So we've changed some of these landscapes a bit here. Um, but, but, it, but, but, but each of them take a different kind of time. And so um, finding your match is always the hardest part of this yeah, whole definitely. story. Yeah, definitely. And I think the upside on that, uh, sorry, is that it brings in diversity, right? So on every level, uh, angels will have different opinions about industries, markets, and, and backgrounds. So that I think it's really helpful. Yeah, the only other thing I'd add is, I mean, time is an important, time invested, but also time to get to an answer matters. And so if you want to do this for 10 years, then, and then there might be the right growth path for that. But I think to Tom's uh, comment around understanding your capital requirements, and like ours changed over time, so we decided we needed that to be able to hit the next inflection point. And that mattered, and we didn't want to kind of limp along for too long before we got to an answer, because we wanted that data back. And then the second thought, and it kind of related to maybe in there your, your question earlier too, of like, there are also like new types of um, uh, capital that you can access, and, and they may not necessarily be in SBIR. So we, we, act, we got close to $3 million in innovation grants that were funded by everybody from pharmaceutical companies to the government to um, uh, nonprofits who were interested in our social mission. And it was tremendously powerful, non-dilutive uh, capital that got us through while we were raising our seed round and then also as a, as a bridge to get to the, the A that were really, really powerful. Uh, and so you know, I, I would encourage you, there's a lot of corporate groups that are also are thinking about investing and they may not necessarily be as savvy in many ways, but um, the, many times you can actually access that capital pretty cheaply without a whole lot of investment. Sometimes you have to be careful and I think you know, in some ways we over-indexed on some of that. But um, I think it's also just another source that you can consider. We have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, do you only invest in your industry or in a certain field? And what is your evaluation methodology for such an early stage? <coughs> so, so I train, uh, I give classes on how to do valuation of early stage companies based on a risk factor analysis. Um, and and none, nonetheless, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is create a company that will be fundable to the next round on the post-money valuation that occurs from the combination of the pre-money valuation and the money in. That's the most important thing you're going to do is be able to be attractive to the next set of investors. And then, um, and, and then uh, you know, I think, uh, what was the rest of your question? Do you invest in your industry? Oh, industry. No, actually, you know, I think a lot of times one of the things that's the most fun about angel investing is that you get to stretch your brain in a thousand different ways. Now, some industries are really complex and you're more likely to, um, to mess up, but that's another reason why to invest with peers that, um, that include some people with deep knowledge and some without. But really, I think a lot of people get a lot of joy from you know, it's almost like a, a, a new business school experience to go back and um, relearn a, a gazillion different things, get exposed to new ways of thinking about things. Um, on the other hand, some focus makes a difference if you're trying to um, really support those companies and move them out to the next round of investors. Yeah, just one quick note on valuation is you have to remember that it is market driven. So you can have the exact same company today versus a year ago and the valuations even in early stage might be dramatically different because it's a matter of who's out there looking to buy shares or looking to invest. Um, and that's frustrating sometimes for entrepreneurs because you hear these stories like why I'm just like that company. It's like your house you know, down the street getting sold for two times yours or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's partly market driven so you have to be, keep that in mind. So I feel like we could keep going. Uh, the more we scratch the surface on this, the more it gets interesting. I hope it has inspired some of you to discover more about how to become an angel, or if you're an entrepreneur, um, how angels can add value uh, to your growth. 
Um, we have more research actually on angel networks at crowdfunding.mit.edu. So if you want to discover more of how the internet is changing some of the relationship between angels and entrepreneurs, I would invite you to go to that website. And please uh, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists uh, today. <laughs>